States Army. I want to share with you all a quote that I think really does get to the heart of the freedom and race uh, statement and, and, and this, uh, this panel. And, and I think that we can apply that through all minority communities. There is another class of colored people who make a business of keeping the troubles, the wrongs, and the hardships of the Negro race before the public. Having learned that they are able to make a living out of their troubles, they have grown into the settled habit of advertising their wrongs, partly because they want sympathy and partly because it pays. Some of these people do not want the Negro to lose his grievances because they do not want to lose their jobs. <laughs> I think the most important thing that we have to come to understand when is we're talking about freedom and race, because there are certain people in our respective minority communities that are retarding the advancement of the individual and liberty and freedom because it benefits them. It causes them this elevated position and relevance. And the most important thing that we have to start doing, as Sonny just talked about, we have to find those common issues by which we can break down this very, very virulent racial divisiveness. You know, yesterday, and I wrote a little Facebook piece about this, yesterday we saw the Confederate battle flag be taken down on the Capitol grounds at the, uh, the State House in Racism Charleston. Is over. But, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna shoot you. <laughs> <laughs> You know, once upon a time, I could have dropped you for push-ups. <laughs> but, but the thing is this, what changes in any of the communities? Does the unemployment rate improve? Does the out-of-wedlock birth rate get better? Do we see more jobs and opportunities in it? I mean, what changes? And so when we see that we have a liberal progressive media and a machine that is able to yell squirrel and everyone goes chasing off, you know, that is the main thing that separates us from being able to talk about freedom when it comes to this false sense of a racial divisiveness in America. So Rachel, what do you think about that? Well, I, I think you're absolutely right, but I also think that um, what we found at Libre is that there's not a rejection of, our, of these free market principles, of conservative ideas. Um, there's not a rejection of those ideas when we take them into the community. What there is is an absence of those ideas. And so I think what's happened for a long time is that people haven't come into the, that those communities and they have been run down, in the case of Hispanics, I can say, they have been run down uh, for you know, 20, 30, sometimes 40 years. Progressive community organizations have had um, exclusivity in these communities and we have not been there. The, the Republican way of outreaching to Hispanics has been to helicopter in about three or four months before a presidential election, say, hey, mm -hmm. we're here, and then they leave. Yeah. And the difference that we're seeing at Libre is that this is a very long-term generational investment. We are embedded in these communities. We aren't leaving. We outlive candidates. We outlive elections. Um, we're offering services. One of the things that we noticed um, right away when we started setting up our own strategy was that these communities were used to getting something, um, you know, and that was how they were building this trust. So La, la Raza or Chicanos por la Causa or whatever the organization was, would come into these communities and they would help people. <coughs> Essentially, they, sometimes they would offer some good services that were actually needed. These are communities that have needs. Um, but along with it came a lot of um, helping people sign up to get more dependency on government. And so what we've done is we go, you know what, we're coming here too and we're doing the same thing. We're, we're, we're hiring from within this community. We're here, we're, we're gonna help paint that, that baseball field that you know, needs repairing. Um, but guess what? We're also offering services. We're offering English language services. We're going to help you start a business. Um, we're going to help you partner with H&R Block and help you figure out how to do your taxes. So these are services that empower. So I would say yes to everything you said, but also that we haven't, as a movement, been in, in on the ground doing the work in a very patient, <coughs> deliberate, long-term investment way. Um, and then in addition, I think in terms of messaging, I think messengers matter. And so um, if, you know, um, Mitch McConnell and I, or my colleague Ronnie Navarro, go into a Latino community and want to talk about these, it, it just might be true that Ronnie and I might be more successful um, than Mitch McConnell. So I do think that as a movement, making sure that when we find people who are artic articulate, who are passionate about these issues, to help move them up so they are in those positions where
where they can reach out to the community. You know, you bring up a great point, and, and I'm going to kind of go to Derek, and then I'm going to go to Sonny. You know, because you are now the vice chairman of the state GOP in the state of Colorado. And one of the things we always hear about is Rachel just brought up this word outreach. And, and like you just said, outreach means you show up in Black History Month, you have fried chicken, collard greens, cornbread, you sing, we shall overcome, and then people never see you again. So Derek, what are the things that we can change so that we have what Rachel was talking about, a, a, a system of policy inclusiveness and principle inclusiveness in our minority communities? Yeah, she's absolutely nailed it. What, what I run around and tell everybody is the issue is relationship, or lack thereof. The issues, for the most part, in the in, in the black communities, uh, and if you've never been, you know, if you go to the inner city, <coughs> our, any city in America, Miami, <coughs> Chicago, Detroit, it doesn't matter. They all look the same. The issue is not policy necessarily per se. It's a lack of relationship. I've said all along, the Republican Party, when it comes to election day, Republican Party, <coughs> as it relates to black voters, does not have an election day problem. The problem is the three years, 11 months, and 29 days in between the elections, and if we start doing a better job on those days, the elections will begin to take care of themselves. So uh, Sonny couldn't be more right in terms of economics, of policy. So Detroit, Michigan is a phenomenal example. Everybody in this room knows what's going on in Detroit. It's no big secret. The city's bankrupt. It's half what it used to be, literally. Uh, one and a half million people now, about 740,000 people, 35,000 buildings waiting to be raised. It's a mess. Detroit is the most heavily populated on a per capita basis black city in America. 88% of the residents of Detroit are black. Yet last November, blacks in Detroit voted Democrat 96% of the time. So that tells me right there the issue isn't policy, right? I mean, if people were making these decisions based on policy, there isn't a black person in Detroit who would so much as consider voting for a Democrat, right? Their policies have ruined their city. The issue isn't policy so much as it is relationship. And, and what, to, to Sonny's point and Rachel's point, that I've gone all around the country and I've asked large rooms of Republicans. I'm a Republican. I realize not everybody here is, but that's the ball field that I play on. I've said, everybody in this room, you know, we're in a major city. Raise your hand if you're a member of your local chapter of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. The most I've ever had was three hands go up. So rather than sitting around at Republican meetings looking at each other saying, you know, we're Republicans talking to Republicans about being Republicans and asking why aren't there more colored faces in here, maybe that's the wrong question. Maybe the correct question is instead of why aren't they coming to us, why aren't we going to them? Because here's what you see in cities all across this country. You've all seen it, Alan's seen it, we've all seen it. You walk down the street in any city USA and you see they got Junior out front sweeping the sidewalk. Open the door, mom's standing there at the hostess station seating people at the tables. Daughter is waiting on the tables. Dad's in the kitchen cooking the food. Grandpa's washing the dishes. And they're just here making it happen. These people are entrepreneurs. These people are fiscally conservative, in a lot of cases socially conservative. But unless we go into their world, join their chambers of commerce, begin attending some of their functions, what happens is they just fall in line and say, well, you know, everybody else here votes for Democrats, so we do too. What we need to do is to start getting out of the little comfort bubbles that we've set up and begin moving to their world and not sit around and ask, why aren't they coming to ours? It isn't outreach, it's inclusion. And inclusion is a much better word, and I completely agree with Alan. I know he can't stand when, when people say outreach because I the picture them. he just... Yeah. He, he made yeah. me drop and do 50 when I used it once, yeah. and I haven't used it ever since. You know, Sonny, you, you brought up a great point about, you know, restoring economic freedom, and, and that's really the means by which you can be a part of the, the American dream. So how is it, how are we going to be, because when I grew up in Atlanta, Auburn Avenue, you know, you had doctor's offices, lawyer's offices, small businesses, you know, it was the cradle of black economic uh, opportunity in the South. How do we get back to individual economic em empowerment instead of this economic enslavement that we see in the minority communities? Okay, well, I would like to go back to your, um, to the quote that you wrote, um, that you read. Um, that's well, a Booker, that, that, that Booker T. Washington. That's a Booker T. Uh, Booker T. Washington quote. I'm a, I'm a big person on context. So to me, it's not just enough to know the quote as to actually know when it was said and why it was said. And if you look when Booker T. Washington uh, made that quote, there were no black Democrats. 
this was at a time when the Democrat Party was fully KKK and the South will rise again. And there were no black Democrats at this time when he made this statement. So the people that he was talking about at this time were the black Republicans. They were the, they were the ones who were coming up out of slavery and now they were getting into politics. They were getting into political moves and Booker T. Washington could not stand those people because they were not talking about the problems that needed to be solved. Like one of the most basic problems that Booker T. Washington saw in the black community is that black people weren't brushing their teeth. So that caused them dental problems, that caused them economic problems, that made it an inability for them to work, inability for them to stay healthy. So one of the first things he did was to say, you, if you're going to come to Tuskegee, then you have to have a toothbrush. You have to start learning about your own personal hygiene, taking care of your own self. He introduced them to the idea of the individual. And that is what planted the seed in them to say, we can do this. But he didn't stop there because he also told them, well, now that you're going to do it and you're going to do it for yourself, now you're going to have to work twice as hard as you worked as a slave because you are doing it for yourself. Now your family depends on you, your wife depends on you, your kids depend on you, so now your work gets even harder. He did not, he gave them an idea of individualism, but he didn't stop there. He also said it comes with a responsibility. And one thing I always say when I go into the black community is being a conservative sucks. <laughs> it sucks. You have to make sacrifices. There are times you have to go without. There are times you wish for better cards. There are times the days are not sunny and bright. The only thing that I can offer you in the end is that it is worth it. And this is Booker T. Washington's philosophy. And under that philosophy, by 19, um, 1907, Tuskegee Institute had um, graduated more self-made millionaires than Harvard, Princeton, and Yale combined. Wow. <laughs> Another one of his quotes was, the greatest thing you can do for a man is put responsibility upon his shoulders and trust him with it. And that's one thing we don't do on the right. We don't trust blacks to listen to our message. We don't trust blacks will get our message. We don't trust that we can beat progressives. And I'll say it again to my face, what are you afraid of? Our, 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 our principles, our, 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 our ideals better than progressives. Yes. yes. What are you afraid of? You can sit to the day is long blaming Democrats for this, that, progressives for this, that. We are the movers. We are the shakers. We are the builders. Tell me we cannot beat them. The day we realize our individual strength will be the day we can actually deliver that message into black communities. Rachel. Say here on a great point, talking about to the to the individual. Do you see or believe that you know the left has been very good at collectivizing the minority communities? Because you know the Hispanic community is not some monolithic community. No, is is very diverse within itself, just the same as in the black community. Yeah. But has that been one of the great tactics of the left to be able to see us as some collective monolithic entity? Absolutely. I think probably one of the most effective. Um, things that Obama has accomplished. And you hear it all the time. You listen to the way he speaks about the American dream. Um, he's basically said the American dream is dead. The American dream is rigged. It's only accessible to those who are, um, you know, well connected. And it's, it's, very, it's a very clever strategy and it's very sad. It's been very effective, I think, in the minority populations. Um, because if, if the dream is dead, then, then you need Obamacare, then you need the government, then you need them. And so I, I think, first of all, that, that has been a very effective tactic. Um, I, I still, I think everything you've said is, is absolutely right on, that, that ideas matter, that people are, 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 um, are open when, when things are, you know, you take it into their community. 
Um, I still think messengers matter. I still think our community needs to do a better job of, of, of putting um, uh, people who can deliver that, the best, that message in the best way into those positions. I think we ought to do a hell of a lot better job of recruiting candidates. Um, I think if you're in a community, especially like Las Vegas, um, you might have, when we sat around at lunch and talked about this a little bit, you know, sometimes there's a slew of candidates. Maybe there's five people vying for a seat, um, and maybe one or two of them is a minority. As a group, maybe it's a good idea to kind of push that one forward a little bit if they're, if, if they're all equal in terms of their, their um, ability. Um, that might matter in the long term for, for the community. And I hate, you know, I, of, of course we, we all sit here and we go race doesn't matter, but again, communication matters, relationships matter, and sometimes to get that foot in the door um, matters. I just wanna say that um, in my own family, my father comes from um, a family of 15. He's a first generation Mexican American here. When he was a little boy, he was a shoeshine boy. And when he was about 12 years old, um, he started his own little piñata business, and eventually he joined the U.S. Air Force and had a 40-year uh, career in the Air Force. Um, of his 15 brothers and sisters, uh, he is the only one who is a self-identified conservative. Um, everyone else is a Democrat. And if you, and I've gone to the barbecues, you know, the family barbecues, and I ask, why? You know, we're all pro-life, we're all hardworking. I don't know if you guys know, Hispanics start businesses at three times the rate of the average American. We are talking about a very highly entrepreneurial group of people. Um, there are people. And um, their answer is very simple. They say, Republicans are for the rich. And that is the impression that's out there. And I think that's something that we have to consider that that's for whatever reason, whether it's because they're believing the Democrats or if we're somehow as a group projecting that, I think that's important information. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. If, if, if they tell you Republicans are for the rich, say yes. Don't, don't be afraid, say yes. And say when you come over here, we can make you rich too. <laughs> okay? Fair enough. This, this is, this is what I'm talking about, the fear. Mm -hmm. Why? I have, a, I have a seat at my table. Come and eat at my table and I'll show you how to get rich too. De in order, Democrats want to be the party of the poor. In order for do them to do that, they have to keep you poor. <laughs> Why don't you want to be with the rich? Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. <laughs> I want to, uh, last point and then we'll open it up from the floor, but you know, Sonny talks about the fear and, and uh, you know, having been in combat, fear is a very bad thing, it paralyzes you. I'd like to hear you all's thoughts about the word racist and the word xenophobe. Why is the left so good at throwing those words out there? I, I know what I think, but I'd like to hear what you all think. Oh man, okay, here's my deal. I don't play race, okay? You want to talk to me about your white privilege as a black person, then show me your white person. Because of course, if you're black and you have a voice, some white person must have said it was okay. And if you're white and you want to talk to me about it, well then show me the black people that you've sponsored. Or you can sign all the money over in your bank account, give me your house, give me your car, because you have used your privilege for way too long. <laughs> I am, I don't, I'm not going to play with them. I'm not going to tolerate them. I have zero fear of them. You can call, say racism exists. It's not a white person on the face of this earth that I think is better than me because I have a Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ in heaven that knows my name. And you are not going to convince me of anything different than that. So I do not play the race card with them. But if I could give you one piece of advice, do not walk to an ethnic community and tell them you are colorblind. It is a lie. Even if you are colorblind, you see in black and white. <laughs> So if you open your mouth to start a conversation with any community and the first line out of your mouth is a lie, yeah. do not expect them to listen to you. Do not expect them to care about what you have to say. If any biggest thing I can say is if we stop playing their game, they lose. <laughs> Thank 
here's how I deal with the issue of race and accusations of racism and all that stuff. The, I don't care. The, the, I don't care. I mean, I, I do not have time to be offended. I, I just don't. Now, I don't have the right to tell you what you find offensive, but personally, I just don't have the time. The, the slogan of my organization, as I told you a moment ago, is truth transcends color. And that's where I go with it all the time. So I've had people ask me, do you think, uh, do you think Rush Limbaugh is a racist? You know, is Rush Limbaugh a racist? And my response, or my answer to that question is, I don't care. I don't, I don't refuse to play the racist game. I'm a racist, you're a racist, we're all racist now. The question is, is it the truth? So if, if the biggest, most unapologetic racist in America today, uh, David Duke, calls a press conference tomorrow right out here in the hallway, and in that press conference he says, five plus five is 10. Is that somehow not true simply because it was said by a racist? I don't care. Is it the truth? And if it is true, then who cares whether or not the person saying it is or is not a racist? So yes, Sean Hannity's a racist. Yes, Rush Limbaugh's a racist. Yes, Alan West's a racist. Who cares? Who call me the a truth <laughs> transcends color. I think it's a great country when a black guy can be a racist. <laughs> Uh, and many blacks in this country are some of the biggest racists you'll ever see here or meet. Uh, uh, a absolutely, a black can be a racist. Absolutely. Rachel, xenophobia. Um, you know, I was raised by um, Hispanic parents who just told me that I could be anything I wanted to be. Um, when my brother was a, uh, um, my, my oldest brother went to school, he's the first one um, in the family to go to um, to elementary school, they, it was, was the 70s, they tried to push him into some bilingual class. My mother with a very thick accent said, you know, if you want someone with an accent, you can talk to me. Um, but I want my own kids, this is the language of opportunity, I want my kids to succeed in this country. And so I was sort of raised by people who just said, work hard, um, you can be anything you want to be. I've never heard my parents ever say to any of our dreams or ambitions of any of my siblings um, that there was something we couldn't do. And so this young boy who was a shoeshine boy, um, who by the way, his great, my father's greatest humiliation as a kid was somebody in, in kindergarten pulled down his pants. They were so poor he couldn't afford underwear. That was, you know, I think it still pains him to this day. Um, but that little boy has four children who are now, um, you know, all have postgraduate degrees, all living dreams that, you know, they're, they're, that he could never, he could never imagine. So my, the whole idea of race to me is just, it just, I believe in the American dream and I, I've lived it, I know it, I know it exists, I don't care what Obama says, um, I know it can happen and that, that's what um, our organization is doing on the ground is we are selling the American dream and I think you're right, people, when you talk about money, when you talk about improving people's lives, when you talk about um, school choice and, and opportunity, and that's what people respond to. And I, 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 I totally agree with what you say about, you know, if they say, um, you know, they're for the rich, great. I think that will work in some circles. But I do think that on, in, in some communities, um, people have to know you care. They have to know you care about them, about their future, about their kids. I think that's another important component. Um, although I do think money talks too. <laughs> and you show you care by saying, I have yes. a seat at the table. Come that's right. sit at my table. That's the best thing you can do to show a person that you care. Is You don't have to make it political. You don't have to make it about politics. You can share a meal and show you care. It's really just that simple. Yeah. Uh, and you can share facts, statistics, and truths. That's so we, we're at the we're at six and a half years now of the most liberal Oval Office that this country has ever had. Uh, the Democrats and liberals have controlled Capitol Hill. They've controlled two out of three or three out of three for eight and a half of the last nine years. So clearly we are living today with the results of liberal policy agenda. The United States currently has more people on food stamps than we've ever had at any point in our history. We currently have more people living at or beneath the federal poverty line than we've ever had in our history. We currently have more households reporting a net worth of $25 million or more than we have ever had in our history. All things have happened on Obama's watch. So the idea that Democrats help the poor and Republicans help the rich, the statistics and the data say the exact opposite.
two million more Hispanics are living in poverty now, um, two and a half million more than when Obama took office. The numbers for Hispanics are horrible. They're even worse for the African American community. That was brutal. I think the thing that this panel is trying to express is that when it comes to freedom and race, you know, it's not about race. Every person wants freedom. Amen. And it's Amen. an individual thing. And what we have to be able to talk to the individuals all across this country is about opportunity and not dependency. And if we are not willing, if we are not able to take this into every single corner, every single community in the United States of America, then this is what happens come 2016, which happened in 2012. When Mitt Romney wins 73% of all the counties in the United States of America, but it gets absolutely blown away in the Electoral College because 27% of the counties in the United States of America gave someone close to 330 Electoral College votes. And how many Electoral College votes do you need to win? 270. The essence of our communities is that we do love freedom. We do want to be successful. We want to restore the future for our children as far as better education, better entrepreneurial opportunities. And that's why don't talk about race. Talk about the American dream. Talk about freedom. What are your questions? Hey, Alan. Uh, Victor the Snake Man. Um, as a member